The student government at one public Michigan school is demanding free menstrual products in all bathrooms, even men's bathrooms. The University of California is planning on cutting ties with Catholic hospitals, and Nicole Hannah-Jones has officially turned down the University of North Carolina's tenure offer. I'm Ophelia Jacobson, and this is the Campus Countdown. Starting off with our number three story of the week, Michigan State University student government has demanded free menstrual products in all restrooms, both boys and girls. The resolution was passed on June 24th by the Associated Students of Michigan State, in which they stated that, quote, transgender people, non-binary people, gender non-conforming people, and women are able to menstruate. They further went on to say that these groups, quote, are not given the same access to these products in their restrooms that coincide with their gender. ASMSU claims it will work with the groups to, quote, take the initial steps towards providing undergraduate students with free and accessible menstruation products. However, they asked for physical support from Michigan State University Infrastructure Planning and Facilities to, quote, install machines, order products, and maintain stocked dispensers. Once again, we are seeing a direct attack on women and the very definition of what it means to be a female. Over the past year, the left has tried to erase gender-specific characteristics such as giving birth and having a certain anatomy. For example, we recently reported on a Columbia Medical School that was urging its students and faculty members to refer to women as people with uteruses. And Harvard University also encouraged its community members to refer to women as birthing people. Since when did science not matter? It is basic science that only women can give birth, only women can have a uterus, and only women, for that matter, can menstruate. Thus, only women need those types of products in their bathrooms. To deny that women give birth, are mothers, and have bodies distinct from men goes against feminism. And it is college campuses that fuel this push to eradicate the things that make women, women. If the university agrees with this student government's proposal, this will be a huge waste of money. The average taxpayer in Michigan should be very upset if their taxes are funding this type of initiative that goes against basic science and contradicts everything that we've known to be true about women and the female body. Moving on to our second top story of the week, the University of California Board of Regents recently voted on an amendment aimed at Catholic hospitals, which will essentially cut ties with medical centers that do not promote certain procedures such as assisted suicide and abortion. The amendment would require that UC disaffiliate with hospitals that restrict care based on religious guidelines by 2023. According to the Daily Bruin, this amendment would apply specifically to Catholic hospitals because they adhere to the ethical and religious directives for Catholic health care services. These guidelines currently prohibit intrinsically evil procedures, including abortion, euthanasia, assisted suicide, and gender-affirming procedures. And according to the University of California Board of Regents, these directives would go against its non-discrimination policy. Now, the Alliance of Catholic Healthcare released a statement in response to this amendment, stating that, quote, disengagement from these partnerships would unravel much of the healthcare safety net that provides access to care and addresses health inequities impacting thousands of Californians across the state. According to the organization, Catholic health systems operate 51 acute care hospitals in California, which represent nearly 15 percent of all hospitals and over 16 percent of the hospital beds in the state. This means that partnerships with Catholic hospitals serve as sometimes the only available local care in the area. The statement also points out that Catholic hospitals are especially important in rural and remote communities, and UC's disaffiliation would leave these communities with little access to local quality health care. This amendment demonstrates that the University of California is prioritizing its will to impose its favored ideology on people of faith, even if that policy jeopardizes the health of students and community members. And just because the university is partnering with religious hospitals doesn't necessarily mean the university has to agree with all of the teachings of, say, the Catholic Church. The Alliance points out that sometimes Catholic hospitals are just there to do the work no one else can or is willing to provide. 
I also find it ironic how the University of California is passing this amendment to adhere to its non-discrimination policy when cutting ties with the hospital just because of its religious beliefs is a prime example of being intolerant of diverse viewpoints. It just goes to show the left's double standard when it comes to moral priorities in the face of wokeness. And for our top story of the week, the Nicole Hannah-Jones saga has officially come to an end. Hannah-Jones has rejected the University of North Carolina's tenure offer. Last week, the University of North Carolina's Board of Trustees voted to grant tenure to Hannah Jones, who is author of the 1619 Project. The 9-4 vote was a reversal of the board's previous decision not to consider her for tenure after Hannah Jones said she wouldn't work for UNC without it. And this naturally caused national controversy. Tenure, which virtually guarantees job security, is usually the result of a multi-year process, not a privilege granted before a professor teaches a single class. It is very rare for a university to grant tenure to someone who has not climbed the academic ranks through teaching and research. However, the Board of Trustees at UNC made the exception for Hannah Jones so that she could be the night chair in race and investigative journalism. But her skills in investigative journalism haven't been praised by everyone. Hannah Jones' major journalistic work, like I mentioned, is the 1619 Project, which has roots in critical race theory and has been widely criticized by both historians and scholars. The National Association of Scholars called on the Pulitzer Prize Board to revoke Hannah Jones' award for the piece, stating earlier this year to campus reform that, quote, there is simply no evidence for Hannah Jones' claims on slavery as a primary motivator for the American Revolution. On July 6th, Hannah Jones officially announced that she rejected the offer that she once fought so hard to receive. Instead, she said she has accepted a position at Howard University in Washington, D.C. as the inaugural night chair in race and reporting. And when asked why she declined the offer, Hannah Jones simply said, quote, it's just not something I want anymore. Hannah Jones simply wanted attention. She got what she wanted, a tenure offer from UNC, and then rejected it. Meanwhile, this caused national controversy, gained lots of media attention, and even caused protests during the Board of Trustees meeting, and all of it for her to reject it in the end. The bottom line is, Hannah Jones shouldn't be teaching journalism at any school in this country. Her so-called investigative journalism is not based on facts. It's based on feelings. Young journalists in college need to learn how to search for and report on the truth, and nothing else but the truth. And Hannah Jones is simply not the right person to be teaching these skills. She has even said herself that the 1619 Project was never intended to be a complete history, and yet colleges like UNC and Howard University have embraced it with open arms and have even pushed it on their students as if it were pure fact. And now that Hannah Jones holds a high position of power within the journalism department at Howard, her 1619 project will certainly serve as an example of journalism for students there. And for our woke tweet of the week, a professor at Riverside City College recently voiced his support of Joseph Stalin on Twitter. Asatar Bear, who is a professor of economics, tweeted, quote, People say I idolize Stalin. Not true. I hold a fair and balanced view. The man was neither savior nor saint, but he was at once a very successful revolutionary, a great contributor to Marxist theory, and said to be a great listener and collaborator during discussions. He later added he would conclude that, quote, he is one of the great leaders of the 20th century. Thank goodness this professor is not teaching history at Riverside City College because he is obviously ignoring the fact that Stalin was in charge of one of the most oppressive regimes in the 20th century. Historians have estimated that 1.2 to 1.7 million people died in the gulags in the Soviet Union under Stalin's rule. And this professor believes he is one of the great leaders of the 20th century. This professor is obviously being held hostage by his communist politics to admit what everyone else knows about Stalin. And it just goes to show how once again academics are trying to distort the narrative on certain historical events and figures. Now those are all the top stories we have for you today. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. You can also follow along with all of the college craziness on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter by following us at Campus Reform. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Campus Countdown, but for now, I'm Ophelia Jacobson. Thanks for watching.